Welcome to New Atlas Live. I'm Brian Berletic. Joining me as always is Angelo Giuliano. And our guest today is Mike Jones from I Earl Grey. I, I just shared the screen with him yesterday on Danny Haifang. I will just try to, we might cover some of the same things, uh, but, but we'll just keep that conversation going today. If, um, Mike, welcome. And uh, why don't you why don't you introduce yourself? And uh, I, I kind of want to ask you about your, your backstory. Uh, your mili- you, you were from the UK. You were in the military. Now you're in Russia. How did that happen? And what are you up to these days? Yeah, there's a huge gap between there. Uh, some 20 years since I was in the military. Uh, so I yeah. went straight out of school. I thought I was a real rebel by not going to university and not getting into mountains of debt. And I thought, nah, I'm gonna get paid to get educated, paid to see the world. They just didn't tell me it was from behind barbed wire fences and everyone wanted to kill me in those parts of the world. <laughs> but I, I thought I was being very clever, uh, but I did my time. Um, then I went off grid actually for five years. I just lived in a caravan in the woods uh, in Wales, building a bit like Ben Law, he was quite popular on Grand Designs in the UK. Um, what do they call them? Straw bale timber framed houses. Uh, I was with the Greta Thunberg gang. That was cool uh, for a while. Uh, but then my daughters grew up and obviously they needed to get back to civilization. Actually, I struggled with that for a while. Uh, and then, yeah, life kind of ended in the UK and I was offered, I was uh, just leading up to that, I was doing um, independent freelance work. Uh, and in the meantime, a friend of mine said, hey, do you know about this Twitch website? Like, no, Twitch in the UK or Twitchers, that's like a derogatory term for either bird watchers or curtain twitchers, which are neighbors that always spy out there and call the police on you for whatever reason. Uh, so I thought that's a bit odd. And he said, no, that people will pay to watch you play games. I was like, well, I can do that. Uh, so I started streaming a video game and becoming quite popular in that circle and the developer uh, offered me a job at the headquarters, but the caveat was you have to move to Russia, to St. Petersburg, uh, to do the job, which was essentially managing all their YouTubers as an influencer manager, essentially. Um, and yeah, the circumstances had arisen where I said, oh, why not? And I didn't for one second believe the BBC portrayal of Russia, and I thought, yeah, this is a great example to see for myself, whether we've got people lining up for green bananas still in their Soviet queues, uh, whether we've got bears and mafia running around with AKs, because everyone in the UK was like, oh, be safe, be safe over there. Uh, and it was, it was the safest, the safest streets I've walked, actually, even at like 4 a.m. after my boss introduced me to vodka and a whole plate of different shots uh, and then let me free to walk home. I was like, and it was at that point I wondered, I wonder if there's any bad parts of St. Petersburg as I traversed the entire city at 4 a.m. because the sun hasn't gone down because it didn't at that point. It was like July, white night at that point. Again, another strange thing where my body was was thrown out. But apparently, no, Uh, there are no bad areas where you'll just get shot for being the wrong color of skin um, in my experience so far. Um, And yeah, uh, since then, I, I was really blown away by the standard of living, the quality of life, the opportunities. Uh, that I saw in Russia. Uh, just bear in mind, I'm a, I am a bit privileged being of my great British passport, which back in 2018 was almost the golden ticket, especially in girls' faces. It was like, oh, because uh, they all wanted to go to the West. Uh, and I was warned by colleagues to watch myself. But despite that, I got snapped up within two weeks and met my wife. And <laughs> we got married uh, about a year or two later. Uh, and yeah, I've been here and enjoyed it. Then... We, we had the world health pandemic thing, uh, which um, was amusing to watch in Russia because I felt that Putin paid lip service to it, like did the minimum. So whilst Russia was very quick within 48 hours of locking down uh, the international borders, I noticed, whereas other countries were very slow, including the UK. Uh, Russia was very quick, but with its, its own measures, it was quite, it demonstrated how um, little the people will just conform to whatever the government says. So they were telling restaurateurs to shut down and they just said, no, because we'll lose business and money. We're not going to. And they formed a little union in St. Petersburg where they got together and they said, nope, we're not going to do it. You can come to our shops if you like and fine us. We're not going to pay it and we're not going to do it. That's just stupid. So they flipped around and said, fine, we'll find the customers who attend these restaurants 
Uh, and that didn't dissuade them either, because all they did is they just pulled the curtains and said, we're closed, but remained open inside. So the inspectors would look round, go, oh, it's shut, in compliance, brilliant. But inside, you're having a whale of a time. So I took pictures uh, whilst my friend was suffering in the UK. I was like, no, I'm having a lovely meal here. Uh, so that, I thought, was quite, quite an interesting attitude. Uh, and I think that's a hangover from uh, the Soviet Union as well, where you know the government didn't always, back then, certainly, inter- ear, you know, uh, represent the people's interests or act in the people's interest. Here, the people very much serve their own interests, and the government actually, or at least the city administration, had to kind of adapt accordingly, because to a certain degree, uh, the people power still was quite evident. Uh, Russia, I think, had one of the lowest uptakes of the countermeasure uh, that they had. I think only 30% of the population went along with it. Most of those were the older um, population um, who we went along with that. So that was a, a really good eye-opener into a difference in culture and, and politics. Then we had the special military operation uh, that, kicked off, that kicked off there. And I think, I actually, in all truth and honesty, I think um, a fair amount of the Russian population were not as aware as probably they should have been of the background, the history of it. So when, and when I say the Russian population, I do mean that as a whole. Like I wouldn't have expected people in Vladivostok to be quite as up to speed as those who were in St. Petersburg. Because once again, even uh, a, my handyman, um, so many people, even colleagues, my manager was Ukrainian, he was from Kharkov. Um, there, there was a lot of integration of Ukrainians in Russia, and there still are. Uh, a good friend of mine uh, who was a taxi driver, a big fan of Zelensky. So I used to have great conversations after a night out, um, just listening to him. And he, and he would say things like, if you like Russia, You'll love Ukraine. It's even better. And this is after the special military operations kicked off, mind you. He was saying, oh, all the freedoms you enjoy here, they are uh, even better in Ukraine. And it was interesting to listen to that perspective. I believe he still holds that opinion to this day. Um, it wasn't that long ago I last spoke to him. And, and there we could both. I disagreed with him uh, personally, and I put forward my case, but despite the language barrier as well, we were quite able to have quite a reasonable and civil conversation about it all. Um, so that's, I hope that's been <laughs> a sufficient timeline uh, to how I got here. And essentially the YouTube channel was just repurposed, which is why I was branded a disinformation entrepreneur by EU Disinfo <laughs> Labs for switching from gaming to geopolitics. Apparently it was all about money and I was a millionaire and I was living the uh, YouTuber rock and roll lifestyle. Uh, alongside Gonzalo Lira, who was mentioned in that same article, and sadly we've seen the consequences of uh, democratic values and Western democracy, certainly in the case of Gonzalo Lira, and I sincerely hope um, that that wrong is righted as soon as possible. Yes, and, and again, for people who don't know, Gonzalo Lira is an, an American and Chilean uh, citizen who is living in Kharkov, Ukraine, and he he basically just said, Ukraine is infested with Nazis, which everybody knows is a fact, and that the government in Ukraine was shelling the Donbas region for eight, now nine years. And these are all f facts, and that's why they arrested him. And I, I see people saying that, uh, no, he was arrested because he was uh, pointing out Ukrainian position. I mean, he lived in the middle of Kharkov. There were no military positions there that he would be pointing out to Russia. It's, it doesn't make any sense. But, Mike, it, it kind of alludes to what you were saying. They, yeah. they pretend that they're democratic. They're making excuses for doing something that's obviously just a blatant violation. They're the own principles that they use as a smokescreen on a daily basis. Now, you you must have had some sort of political awakening when I joined the military. Very, very similar mentality that I had when I went in. Uh, I, 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 I bought into almost everything when I signed up. But very quickly, I... I realize what, 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 what's going on here. Did you have a political awakening or were you not political at all? And you just you just joined for college money and to just, you know, get get out, do something different. It, it was a combination of all the above. Uh, I was aware that Tony Blair was lying. Absolutely. Um, we also had. Oh, who's the guy that was disappeared and suicided? The weapons inspector, John Kelly. I, I distinctly something remember that Kelly. growing up. Yeah, yeah it was yes, something yes, Kelly. Yes. And the BBC were there, so we oh, very clearly commit suicide. But then even they started questioning, uh, saying that, oh, maybe he didn't. Uh, so there, I knew that there were things that the government were lying to us about. And I, I enlisted around the time. I enlisted as an adult, so I was 17 turning 18. 
And this was around the time of the uh, second Iraq um, invasion uh, under Tony Blair. So I was under no illusions, really, that it was an oil, oil war. Um, it was just then when I'd finished my training and then realized um, that this is not glorious at all. Uh, it's actually ha the, uh, hellish. Um, I'd grown up with like Kosovo as well and uh, Northern Ireland and things like that. I heard stories about Northern Ireland uh, where, yeah, it was really hellish there. And one thing that popped up um, in, because I draw a lot of comparisons actually with Northern Ireland and, and the situation in Ukraine, or they certainly come to me in my head. And one thing that I didn't twig or click or connect the dot on was something that a Russian Orthodox reporter said to me when I was embedded with this Orthodox volunteer battalion on the front lines near Ugladar. He said, um, I can tell you why this war is so brutal. I said, well, why? Because we're sitting in these bombed out areas. And uh, he pointed out, he said, do you see that car there with the number plate? I said, yeah, I see a few of those. He said, yeah, they've still got the Ukrainian flag on there. I said, yeah, I see a few of them. I've seen them in St. Petersburg. He said, yeah, these ones we call the waiters. These ones are waiting for Ukraine to come back. Uh, and he said, this is, this is where the war is so brutal because it's religion and civil war. And I was like, wow, yeah, that's the same in Northern Ireland. That was a savage, savage time. And this is no less and no less disgusting and hellish. And I think he may have had a point there. And we've seen it in Kiev with this attack on the Orthodox Church and this schism and this divide there. Uh, I think he may have a, a really good point that I don't think is really considered or even highlighted in the media about just um, why this is so dark in that respect. So that was, that was kind of an enlightening thing. But joining the military, uh, it was a case of fighting for the man next to you. It was no longer about queen and country and doing one's duty so much. The duty was to keep the man next to you alive because he's watching your back. And pretty much do your time and get out. Uh, I joined with the idea of the full 22 years. Uh, heck no. <laughs> I got out on the uh, as early as I could. And sadly, many of my surviving friends then told me I did exactly the right thing. I got out at precisely the right point. I actually did it to get back to my young partner at the time uh, with my first daughter to help raise her because uh, I started straight out of the gate. People look at me really suspiciously when I say my daughter's 20 years old. They're like, sorry, how old are you? I was like, I'm 37. <laughs> and they're like, what? I just, I literally got refused a beer this evening from my local shop. They're like, no, Nilsia bez passport, which means not allowed without a passport. I was like, what? I'm, I'm nearly 40. <laughs> Why can't I just buy a beer? Which is, which in Russia was considered a soft drink up until like the early 2000s. <laughs> it's like, it's not even vodka. <laughs> no, it's, so. it's flattering. A Angela, if you have any questions, please, please. No, in. no, I have, I have such a great pleasure to listen to Mike. There's uh, so many yeah. interesting stories. Uh, what I like uh, from Mike is that he lives on the ground, and uh, I feel, I feel very connected to what you say, Mike. That uh, what triggered you is that you were living a certain reality, and then you listen to the reality that is portrayed outside of Russia, and I have exactly the same with China. Uh, to be honest, I'm not. I wouldn't say I'm a big fan, you know, of course, I love this place. I've been here, I mean, more than half of my life. But it's just to, just to give it justice. Uh, China has been good to me and I've seen like good things, so many good things. And I, I see this injustice that we are, that the collective West is, um, how they're portraying those places like Russia and China. And you cannot not speak out and you have legitimate voice. It's not, we are comparing to people that are in a studio in New York, Washington, you know, they, they, you know they've, read a, they've read a few books about Russia and they are self-proclaimed experts and, and we live on the ground. And I think those stories that you are telling on the daily life, on, you know, on a daily basis, you know, about, you know, security, just simple things, simple things, you know, uh, anecdotal, you know, things, uh, it tells so much more than than all those fake stories because you you know you you have so many examples examples of that that you live uh, uh on a daily basis so I, I feel i feel very connected to your experience there and um and, uh, i think it's a it's a plus for us we have uh, we have the, the opportunity also with brian you know, just to live outside it gives mm -hmm. you another perspective you know you know chinese how they they say they say uh 
people, you know, sometimes you can be like a frog inside a well. You know, when you're at the bottom of the well, you look at the sky and the sky is very, very small. And that's that this metaphors makes me think about, you know, what average Joel is living in the collective West. You know, he's in the bottom of that well and his perspective, his, his, his sky is very small. And I think that's our responsibility uh, for us just to just to, to tell the reality. You know, we don't we don't need to embellish it, just the reality. The, and, and it's it's another word from what we're seeing in the in the in the Western media. Yeah. And, and Mike, you you went to Russia as a, it was a business opportunity, more or less. And you started out by uh, streaming, gaming, uh, and and people say you're you know you're doing this because you're a Putin propagandist, and this is you're making a fortune doing this. But I mean, I, I know from my own experience, I had a I had a different line of business that I was in. I was doing industrial design. I really enjoyed doing that, and I didn't have to worry about turning myself into some sort of political target by doing it. And I, I mean, it's, I think I know what the answer is, but just for you to say it, I mean, which did you enjoy doing more? Uh, playing games, getting paid to play games and, and doing something like that, or painting a giant target on yourself, getting banned off of YouTube every other week? I mean, which, which, which one? Did, did you find uh, more relaxing and and fun? I, hon I honestly wish, because I was honestly paid to play games, um, not just through streaming, but even when I worked for the developer, I was contractually obliged to play the game for a certain number of hours every day to know what I was talking about. Uh, actually, that job was horrendously stressful, despite you know th seemingly being a chocolate factory job. Um, it it wasn't at all. It was you know even ended up having to go to the doctor for like stress related physical symptoms and things like that because of deadlines and all sorts of other things uh so i i still stuck at it and enjoyed it but um yeah when it it felt crass and fake to be promoting a digital universe and distraction and what was hilarious it was a second world war themed game uh, themed game and yet that was the most vicious community uh, with regards to the special military operation and their support of Kiev, instant support for Kiev, without any research, the Reddit battalion and all that. And there's a whole thread you can find on I.L. Grey. If you go on Reddit and look what happened to I.L. Grey, all the people that ever had anything, any bone to pick with me as they're venting their uh, outrage at the fact that I was this Putin propagandist. And they're like, yeah, I knew he was a bad egg all along. Yeah, this is just what I expected him to do. He'd side with the evil Russians. Of course he would. Uh, so I, I did it through... Um, I, first of all, it was almost disbelief that especially the UK was so vicious and so escalatory. And their rhetoric as well really actually took me away and initially it was kind of a laughing thing between friends on whatsapp of like listen to this rubbish uh incidentally one of my ex-army friends was saying in january because uh, many people asking me is russia gonna uh, go into ukraine i was like i don't think so uh i think putin's lining up his sort of diplomatic leverage and he's going to use that as much as possible if he goes into ukraine and the donbass he's going to lose that leverage so i personally don't see it and a friend said buddy you're absolutely wrong um, I'm here training Ukrainians on javelins. Uh, we're ready to go. And this is a British serving British Army soldier. So first of all, I knew NATO was in there. Uh, he later quickly blocked me <laughs> and deleted me and deleted the conversation. So I can never show that <laughs> as proof. That's going to have to remain an anecdote at, at this point. But yeah, very early on, I was like, wait a minute, there is way more to this than I ever considered. And then did my research. And um, yeah, uh, I faced the wrath of, uh, first of all, the gaming community. Uh, many developers based in Kiev, by the way, quite a lot of them in the gaming industry. Uh, so yeah, I got a lot of hate mail from those guys. Uh, but then with YouTube, I lost, uh, of 10,000 gaming subscribers, I lost 100. And within six months, gained 100,000 from across the world. Uh, which told me pretty much all I needed to know. And that was just helped by the West in their attempts to block the Russian perspective. Uh, more people, as uh, I think, Brian, you've benefited as well. Uh, Patrick Lancaster has benefited uh, as people have turned to independent media. Uh, media that doesn't have to, isn't contractually obliged to just parrot the state narrative. 
unquestioningly um, people. Yeah, certainly Patrick Lancaster springs to mind, who has invested you know, nine years of his life into this story. And it's good to see that he's getting the exposure and the credit that he finally, uh, he's definitely earned and he finally deserves. Uh, so in my case, uh, yeah, it has been, there's been other stresses. Because no, it's not the rock and roll lifestyle uh, that, that people may think and living on savings, uh, certainly recently. Uh, but it was, it, I, I make no bones about it. I was saving any excess money from YouTube revenue. And yeah, that's what I used to fund the trips to Donbass. And I wholly believe that's why NewsGuard, um, behind them, the US State Department, painted a target on me and so effectively shut down my YouTube channel uh, with such scrutiny and diligence as they did because uh, I, I, was, I was being honest, and that's exactly what I was doing, and they knew it, that these Western companies that were sanctioning Russia, pulling out of Russia, yet still advertising on YouTube, now their money was being used <laughs> to benefit people of Donbass, unabashedly. Uh, so yeah, that's how we got here. So yeah, you're right, Brian, it's, it's not as glamorous as it seems. I think even a comment on the stream we did with Danny Haifong last night, someone was saying, Oh, this is disgusting. This guy's got a social media presence, so he's scalping. Uh, whereas I've lived in Zaporozhye and I've paid for support for Donbass uh, since 2014, and I've got no credit. <laughs> I was like, well, I'm s sorry, dude. <laughs> I don't know. I'm not scalping, but uh, okay, you, if you feel that you should do it. And as someone rightly said, do please set up a YouTube channel and show us all. Uh, you'd get the support, and I absolutely would, and I'd support that guy. Uh, Donbass HUM Aid was one existing charity that I supported and still support now, uh, who I think can accept donations from the West as well, that um, work with the church as well, that help people out there, um, is another alternative for people. So I've never said, like, I'm the only guy delivering humanitarian aid out there. Um, but, it, yeah, it's, um, I, I'm curious about this shift as well, where people are getting their news sources, because I find myself um, scrolling through uh, many mainstream media things just to kind of get an idea of what the narrative is not what the news is what's the narrative today how are they spinning these events then i'll go to places like the duran on youtube or locals rumble and this place is and then i'll go to the people that um i would you can't even say that you trust at this point uh you know in you know, in so much if we want to take everything with a pinch of salt but the people's whose opinion analysis perspective just make more sense than the narrative that you've seen there. And you can take their insights, some things that quite often I've never considered, uh, certainly Alex Christoforou and Alexander McCurry spring to mind with their sort of um, experience and uh, ideas as to what the motivations perhaps, like of von der Leyen's um, lack of support for a ceasefire, for instance. Yeah, I can make some guesses as to why I think she's saying that. And then they may add some extra perspectives. And this, is, this adds to this quality of critical thinking which is getting lost. And I shared a Daily Mail article. Again, I don't usually share the Daily Mail, but this one's talking about the hundreds of thousands of pounds, reportedly, people are paying to have Russian-style maths lessons for their children because it, part of that is teaching critical thinking and algebra. And that made sense to me because of Putin announcing the withdrawal from the Bologna process, uh, which is kind of the Western University accreditation system. Uh, they announced they'd withdraw from that and go back to the Soviet style and curriculum. Uh, this idea of trying to uh, merge the curriculum or curricula across the world, Russia's pulled out of that and they're going back to um, some of the good old style education. And it seems that private institutions that are also adopting that are now in demand seemingly in the West, according to, according to the Daily Mail. There we go, it's quite fascinating stuff. That, that, that's interesting that that would be in the Daily Mail. Uh, who yeah, knows? Yeah, we'll play You, you have, so, to, have to be uh, careful. Not sure about that. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, and, and the other thing is a, a lot of people are doing are doing charity in the Donbass region, and these are people that obviously need help. Um, somebody has to document that. Not everyone can afford to do it. Not everyone has the time to do it or, or the ability uh, but someone has to also document that process. So you 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 have been doing that. I've been learning a lot by watching those videos. I also actually, when you used to stream RT stuff on YouTube, because it's just easier for me to find it on YouTube. Yeah. Uh, and I, I actually I actually I actually was in uh, on some of those streams where you were live streaming something from from RT on YouTube. 
Uh, so it, it, it is actually very useful and it's good to have a, a variety. And I, you know, people shouldn't say, well, I'm doing it this way. Everyone should do it this way. Uh, we need a variety of approaches because uh, the, the other side, they have absolutely every angle covered. Uh, we, we have to do all of this ourselves. So I, I, I think you're doing a, a really useful thing. Obviously the charity is, is absolutely necessary, but also documenting the process is, is very helpful for people to understand what's going on, what these people need, the, the state that the people in that area are in. And that's kind of something that I want to talk about next. You're, you're along the line of contact. I think you say you've been quite, quite close to the line of contact and you're in areas that have been affected by the fighting um, what what are you seeing and your your military background do you feel like that that has given you a unique perspective that maybe some people in the media that are there also might might not have um yeah to an extent um yeah there's there's quite a lot to process on there just just as an aside the sort of humanitarian thing was kind of lending into what i i said before about being angry at my country uh so i'm my main focus was in the smallest way possible you know not smallest way possible despite the fact i'm just a drop in the ocean of all the needs and all the devastation that the the west has caused which you know i feel partly guilty for i guess on a level of trying to write some of that wrong and in therefore so doing documenting and communicating the story which is another as you say an important thing so there's a little bit of a personal selfish reason i guess you could say uh, on there uh, along the front lines um yeah i'm trying to trying to tease out the sort of civilian side of things where honestly people are just getting on with things there's very little complaining I, I don't think i've heard a single civilian sort of just say oh woe is me isn't my life so bad? Um, not, not at all. Uh, it's usually, you know, thanks for what you've brought, and do you have any of this, which is useful for them to ask, so that we know maybe next time. Because interestingly, in Severodonetsk, it wasn't the fact they needed food, it was the fact they needed toiletries, and pampers, and uh, feminine hygiene, and things like this, um, which, you know, is, was a curious deficiency in particularly that area, which helped us for the next trip. Uh, with the military, um, as I touched on before with you, Brian, there was, um, I was surprised that the soldiers weren't caught up in, uh, the kind of red mist that can fall, so fall soldiers where it's like the enemy is dehumanized and they're all the people in the West are devils, demons that need to be eradicated. It absolutely wasn't at all, despite some suspicion of me due to my nationality. Uh, being British and of course um, the British government having their attitude as it is they they um, they listened to my story and then they were they said thank you for it thank you for what you're doing that has helped us boost our morale no end knowing that there are not just people like you working like this but there's people in West that support you uh, but equally that they could see that the elites did not represent the people something Putin himself has said uh, and that was eye-opening for me um, to understand, very encouraging as well. But the sad fact being that these uh, people's very families and homes are threatened by that same government means these men have no choice to fight um, in... Well, they do, but not from a moral or, or duty perspective. They absolutely feel that they have to take up our arms and serve. And I'm talking more, more along the lines of the DPR militia, uh, who are still a, a kind of separate entity. So I'm talking around Donetsk. Uh, obviously, the Russian army and perhaps the mobilized uh, won't feel quite that their homes are under threat so much, but uh, definitely the people of Donetsk uh, that have to serve. Some of them who are actually with injuries that would have had them invalided out uh, in general, but they either refuse to report these injuries or um, have managed to stay there to contribute, which again is admirable in and of itself. But that's how desperate their situation is from their point of view. Uh, and how much they believe that hopefully this will get resolved and it'll come to an end. And then people like myself uh, hopefully can achieve something through our audiences and the actions of the audiences in said countries to also work to bring this back, uh, bring this to an end. Ideally through negotiations, China being one of the big countries leading in the charge, talking about peace 
and putting forward peace plans, workable peace plans, potentially, as opposed to Zelensky's uh, get out of our land and return to 1991 idea, um, which there. So, yeah, quite quite opening there. I hope that answered your question, Brian. Yes, um, a Angelo, do you have any any questions? I got I got a bunch more <laughs> from my well, side, Angelo. Well, I can imagine the you know uh, how people from from Lugansk and Donetsk and 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 Crimea. Uh, just imagine for a second, you know, some science fiction, if uh, if Russia was to lose and uh, retract from those places. I mean, we are we are talking about uh, genocide, and it's and they're calling for genocide like openly, derussification of those places. Uh, so, I can imagine anybody just taking uh, taking up arms to to save save you your place because it, uh, you see, there's a uh, Ukrainians. If you're on the Ukrainian side, well, you know, if Russia comes in, you're okay, you know. But if you are on uh, those provinces that, that were threatened by the neo-nazis well if you lose against ukraine you're gone you 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 are going to die whoever accepted the russians in those four regions and crimea it's going to be extremely bad and they and they say it openly what scares me is that they say it openly when it comes for for, for to, to crimea uh and and nobody criticized that you know so so uh, I, I just cannot imagine just myself being, I, I would take up arms, you know, I'm against war, but, you know, if I was in those provinces, I would take up arms because, because they, you, it's not about, you know, occupation. This is going, it's going to be a, there's going to be a genocide, you know, I, and I, 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 I'm very careful about, you know, how they use genocide so lightly, but in the case of those Russian areas in Ukraine, they would do genocide. That's what they were prepared to do before the special military operation. Two points. Did you hear what Arastovich said from the safety of Israel about what they're doing in Donbass? Once they retake it, they'll divide the population into three categories. So there'll be the collaborators, the willing collaborators, and they'd be dealt with. Uh, then there'd be the sort of second group of like uh, a director of a company that repaired Russian machinery. And he's saying, well, the fact you didn't resign, you'd be in the second group and we'd go for you, like take away your voting rights for 10 years, seize your property, uh, issue fines and do this. And he said, well, the third one, there'll be like the elderly that took a Russian pension or something. We'll forgive them. Uh, <laughs> it was amazing. Well, who's left? That. Yeah, but, but you know, I'm shocked at one thing. I, I don't know if you followed. You know, I mean, so many times they are the glorifying the the Israeli model, and yeah. you know, I, I've I've been thinking that you know they, they there is a plan. I, I don't know. It's just a speculation on my side. But you know, I feel like there's a plan. You know, the the same as they use Israel to to mess around the Middle East. You know, they want you know somehow to create a new Israel. In Ukraine, Aristovich has actually literally said yeah. that, and yeah. and then and then we would have Taiwan the same. Yeah, just you highly and militarized, those... and you put like a crazy ideology, nationalistic uh, ideology, very racist. I mean, what do we have in Israel? You know, it's very, it's very much like everybody has weapons. They just, just all most of them are, are nuts. You know, you're the, there's this indoctrination through the army and the, the sense of superiority. Well, you know, how different is Ukraine? It was Zionism it was specifically what Aristovich was talking about with regards to like the Slavic people in Ukraine. It would be the Zion of the Slavs sort of sort of thing. And he was talking in that way. If anyone doubts about anything about a genocide against Russian people, then Lindsey Graham's words were absolutely uh, illustrative of that. Russians are dying and it's the best money we've ever spent. I mean, that tells you so much. Uh, certainly about the person, the mentality, uh, the elite or the structure that he represents, the portion of society he represents, and also what Russian people have suffered. And that attitude is shared by pretty much, uh, again, the ruling elites in Ukraine. You can't say Ukrainians all want that. I don't believe that for one second. Uh, as I've said, I've, I've uh, been living alongside Ukrainians for years. Uh, so you, in the, just the same way, you can't say the British all hate Russia. No way do the Ukrainians all want genocide against uh, the Russian population, certainly not in the Donbass, but certainly those that are in these uh, areas that coordinate and execute these actions. Like we've seen these terrorist attacks now against Russia, 
they're almost farcical in their fanaticism as well. Uh, I was discussing with you guys before the show about this story I read today about them driving across the border in two tanks in an attempt to hoist this flag of this Russian Liberation Army, this so-called partisan group inside Russia. These are Ukrainians, I'm told, uh, or part of the Ukrainian military. They've dro driven in with two tanks, which are hardly expendable by any means of the imagination, as we all know. Uh, whilst they're doing that, artillery fire then comes in. They've been spotted. They run up to get this flag. That tank gets hit. Uh, then they run to the second one to escape. That tank gets hit, and all they're left with a photo of this charred rag uh, of this photo stunt that they tried to pull, and it cost them two tanks. But I guess they think that's worth it, justified, much with all this PR offensive, and uh, now that the spring offensive is officially over, uh, all this PR offensive and the lives that they throw away to do it. But they certainly the elites just don't care certainly lindsey graham doesn't care how many ukrainian lives were thrown away if it cost you know just uh, one or two russian lives in in exchange for what was it seven ukrainian lives i mean this is yeah satanic stuff but you, you know yeah, what this, and, this, and, this, oh yeah brian no i just <laughs> wanted to touch on the the genocide issue because beside all of what what you ukrainian government might be planning they have openly persecuted Russian speaking Ukrainians across the country. They've legislated restrictions on the Russian language, and now they're going after the Orthodox Church. Th these are things that the US has accused China of and called genocide, that there mm. is no evidence that China is even actually there's evidence that China does the exact opposite. It preserves all of all of these things. This is what the Ukrainian government is already doing. So uh, again, a, a, as you said, if people are doubting, just open your eyes and open your ears. They're openly saying it. And it's just the, the Western media hears it. They even report it, but they don't put it in the proper context. The same context that they, they put their fabrications about, say, China in. Uh, I, I wanted to talk about because I we, we you know we were familiar with Patrick Lancaster's videos. I, I I repost them from time to time, and you see the Ukrainians just attacking civilian civilian infrastructure, houses, uh, uh, civilian institutions. As as you're traveling across the Donbas region, are you are you seeing evidence of that? And, and yeah, absolutely. What, what evidence? And I can corroborate one of Patrick's uh, last videos. He was on Redacted. Uh, Redacted is doing great work too. Uh, another place I, I go to, certainly um, with sort of US-based stories as well. Uh, I actually went to a site of a research institute, a science research institute that was hit with a total of six HIMARS, uh, three in the first salvo. Then they waited specifically 28 minutes for the emergency services and journalists to arrive before then unleashing the second salvo that Patrick was nearly caught in. I must have just arrived shortly after him because I've got footage of the same devastation there. And I went around the, the entire perimeter of the building, uh, looked around for anything remotely military that could possibly justify the targeting of this. And given how HIMARS is sold as being such a you know, wonderfully specific um, munition that can hit wherever it's targeted, well, they very clearly targeted a civilian structure there. I, I didn't see, and neither apparently did Patrick or anyone else that was documenting this, uh, see any justifiable targets. And that's the same MO that I've seen before. Same with Lugansk, where um, I documented this Storm Shadow uh, missile fragments that one of them literally had Storm Shadow for Storm Shadow use only printed on it. So it's fair, unless the Russians stamp that, which I highly doubt, <laughs> which some people might say they did. Uh, but given even the shape of the nose cone that was consistent with the uh, Storm Shadow missile, that was very clearly um, uh, aimed at civilian infrastructure. So again, you have to laugh with the with the rhetoric of the Western leadership that say, oh, oh we're giving them these long range weapons, but they promise they won't use them against civilian structures. And then we have all these reports. And then even even with these incursions into Russian territory, I've yet, I've got to speak carefully now, I've yet to see any military target that's been successfully struck on that. All I've, perhaps you could say fuel depots, maybe that could be considered a viable military target. 
perhaps and maybe i can give some sway on there but most of it has been from what i've seen civilian stuff and that's been consistent terrorism uh, no less the moscow strikes i don't believe they hit now russia's claiming they shot those down uh, in much the same way as ukraine will say a russian missile wounded so many people but we shot them all down well then then you're sort of arguing semantics as to well did did russia wound those people or did U ukraine's actions result in the wounding of, of those people uh, and so on so yeah i mean uh, just across the board from what i have seen in the donbass these western weapons are consistently aimed at the civilian as they have been for nine years you don't airstrike the center of lugansk by the city hall um by accident uh, i've you know we've seen i think most of us have seen that footage uh, of these specific airstrikes using NATO, generally using NATO equipment. Angela, I accidentally cut you off. What, do you do you remember oh. what you were going to say? Uh, well, I forgot. But uh, but here yeah, it's uh, it's interesting that we we even stopped uh, we, because we've repeated so much that uh, the Ukrainians are targeting civilian population. We even stopped actually just mentioning this, just because mm. you know, it's just uh, people don't they don't understand. It. And on the other side. The few civilian populations that are that are killed in the Ukrainian side, they kill because of uh, and uh, mainly anti-air missile uh, sh shooting. You know, it's just so basically they want to hit a, a missile, a Russian missile, and then you have you know the debris that comes down and randomly kills civilians. But so basically you have two sides, and I, I don't want to point you know the bad and the good, but that is so obvious. Russia is actually trying really hard just not to have civilian casualties and you have on the other side ukrainians that deliberately they are aiming at civilian population uh, it's it's a lucky coincidence isn't it that ukraine shoots down all these missiles but russia yeah. manages to score a lucky hit on the headquarters of the sbu <laughs> it's funny yeah. that, and, and i have and there are so many so absurd stories it's just a I just don't know how much they, I mean, they, so many big lies. I mean, you just, you know, you bomb your own pipeline, you bomb a prison that you, you went through a hard time just to, to get those as of prisoners. And then mm. you bomb themselves, yourself, right? And then you, you bomb a nuclear power plant that you are controlling. And then, yeah. and then civilian population that are bombed in Donbass. I mean, how many times we had, oh, the Russians did it. Mm -hmm. it's yeah absurd. i mean just you know average joe i mean just wake up just, just it's common sense actually we don't even need to go to watch tas or rt no just look at the contradiction of western media that's Nike. how my channel started was like hang on this week they've said this and now this week it's this like bakhmut is entirely inconsequential then it's strategic and then it means nothing again it's like <laughs> sorry i've got to, i've got to document this because my memory's not good enough anymore to keep track of all these changing storylines and narratives and then it's russian backed separatists uh, and, and all, all this stuff and it, oh yeah, the, you even work yourself in knots. Patrick Lancaster, again, just to give that one example, even on his redacted interview, he then had footage where the Australian media had said that that high Mars strike was Russia that did it. And there's even him lying on the floor. <laughs> under the so Russia under the did high capture a high Mars. And, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. So Russia captured the high Mars because it was clearly high Mars missiles. And again, he shouldn't really laugh, should you? But it's that farcical and um, that much of a pantomime at this point uh, that it's very difficult not to and by the way well, just that, to clear up something earlier we're talking like about critical thinking someone said why would you teach critical theory in mathematics i was like no it's critical thinking not critical theory that's a very different thing it's something else <laughs> yeah well this is this is another question that um people who have not who have not seen firsthand the violence that the, the U.S. sows all mm. around the, the globe. Uh, when you're seeing when you're seeing this, uh, how how are you dealing with it? I, when when we were on Danny Haifang's show, we both talked about how it's it's anger, it's outrage. Mm. And I think it's the same for Angelo, too. Uh, you see what the U.S. is doing. You see how it's hurting people around you, people that, you know, destroying places that you walk by every single day. And how can you not get angry? And how how do you deal with that? And maybe 
talk to the audience a bit about how how you deal with that. You see these scenes, you see these people. Um, how do you deal deal with that? And is is your work that you do part of how you're dealing with it? Because I, I know for for me it is it's definitely. Yeah, it gets harder actually with every visit. Um, partly now since people that I've met from the first time are now dead. Uh, I always said that when you are exposed to that much darkness, it does take a piece of your soul. And the sad thing is then I'm almost, almost a little bit reticent to engage with some people now because I fear that the next time I, I go back there, they I'll get told that they're no longer with us. Uh, and then I've already touched on some of the guilt that I feel for that due to the actions of the leaders of my country, which feeds into my anger at the betrayal of my country. Um, and again, on the personal level, I feel it's a betrayal of what my grandfather fought for uh, in the Second World War. So, yeah, unfortunately, those are sort of quite uh, dark sides of the emotions. And then to hear, see and read the comments, uh, not just on YouTube, across all the platforms, uh, Rumble and especially in locals and even the emails that I get, uh, sometimes it is a bit of a wake-up call to understand just how important or how much value people place on the videos that I'm putting out, uh, even just showing the different headlines and showing the different perspective. Uh, and unfortunately, due to John's rather quick ringing of the alarm bell, uh, then there were, of course, people uh, who then got in touch with other people. I was told of someone in the Netherlands uh, as well who'd... Uh, I, I investigated some of these kidnapped children and things, and she'd had a, an experience with that, uh, and then iterated uh, just how important it was to to go in and ask these questions. Uh, and then when even we talk about Ukrainian POWs, I was working with Isabella Lieberman. Uh, she's a journalist based in Donetsk, and she's been working to track down the families of these Ukrainian prisoners and just let them know that their husband's alive because Ukraine, to avoid paying out to anyone, just marks them as missing in action. And maybe they're dead, uh, but some of them are, are alive and safe and in custody and able to send video messages. So I've also been, uh, Mash has been subtitling them and I've been publishing them. And that, again, is important work, but you can't, you, you certainly can't help everyone that you wish you could. Uh, and then some of the messages you get from some of those families as well to, because that's, that's priceless. You can't put a monetary value on just knowing that your loved one is alive. Many of these wives, you know, are maybe even pregnant as well and expecting children, not knowing if that children that child's fatherless or not. And again, despicable behavior, in my opinion, from the Ukrainian government, given that the U.S. taxpayer is bankrolling them. And clearly that money's not going to the people it should uh, due to the actions of, of NATO and, and the collective West. So, yeah, that... Uh, yeah, that does feed in, and that key, that gives me the term determination to yeah keep getting uh, banned and uh, struggling day to day to wondering maybe if you'll have to take a job next month, uh, even if it is with RT to pay the bills. But I'm fighting that tooth and nail in all truth, because uh, I uh, yeah I know where I need to be at this point in time, and I think now is more important than ever. And um, people ask sort of why you do it. Well, if not me, then who? And if not now, then when? I think these are extremely important times that we're living in. Mike, can, can I add one, one thing? Uh, a lot of people, they, they take a lot of, sh uh, sh easily a shortcut when it comes to us. And I think I can speak for, for all of us uh, that uh, we basically, we love, uh, you know, the shortcut. We love uh, Russia, we love China, and we hate all countries. And actually, it's exactly the opposite. I would say that uh, we do criticize our countries out of love. And I, I like mm -hmm. to take the example that... Uh, Let's say if someone in your family does something wrong, if you love that person from your family, you criticize and you try to repair the wrong that uh, this person is doing out of love. And I think the cowards that actually are staying silent in our countries that act, no, on the opposite, not mm -hmm. silent. Silent, I can understand. Some people, you know, they don't have the distance, you know, just uh, it's, it's not easy to get the, the whole picture. But people that actually are for war, that are 100% yeah. for Ukraine, and uh, they blindly follow, willingly, you know, knowingly or not, you know, those are culprits. Those are actually the ones that don't love their country. You see, yeah. you see, and, and, and 
I, I don't see, you know, because I, I ask myself, am I betraying my country sometimes, you know? And I'm like, not. Actually, the ones that are betraying their countries are the ones that are supporting those wars. And in reality, what we need to do in the West is actually re-empowering ourselves. We need to get mm. our country back, our democracy back, and power to the people again, you know, democracy. We need to regain our sovereignty and democracy and then we are doing something for our country. And I think somehow the three of us, we are doing something for our country here. You know, but it's not by supporting our country to do to blindly sleep walk into World War Three. I, I think um one day I might enjoy trying to explain that to the UK police. Uh <laughs> <laughs> but for the time being, I'm just gonna I'm gonna keep myself busy here first before I try and re-educate the PC plod. Uh, Kit Clarenberg had a five-hour session, yeah. from what I read, when he returned to the UK. Uh, freedom of the press and freedom of speech, make of that what you will. Uh, and again, I'll draw attention to uh, Julian Assange and Gonzalo Lira once more when we talk on those lines. Uh, yeah, when it. Well, just because Putin said that the elites of the West do not represent their people doesn't make it uh, not true. It is true. And this is partly, again, Brian, you said you used to enjoy watching me restream. I used to restream Lavrov, Zakharova, Putin. All those speeches were nuked on YouTube. And I know exactly why. And I think it's also the same reason that the US strongly advises its citizens don't come to Russia. And I think just simply put, because they'll hear things the U.S. doesn't want them to hear and see things they, the U.S. doesn't want them to see. Uh, I know of a prison officer who went with uh, John Mark Dugan to Donbass, uh, who got back to his job, was immediately suspended, questioned by the FBI, and uh, an hour of those questions was about me, about how he met me, what points of the border I crossed, what vehicle I drove, how I was paying for my family in the U.K., how I was transferring money. Uh, which again is you know a U.S. U.S. law enforcement system questioning about a U.K. citizen, um, and then uh, on on top of of that regard, when you talk about you know loving your country, I enjoyed Judge Napolitano's interview with Scott Ritter. Uh, Judge Napolitano was talking about Tara Reid, uh, why perhaps Scott didn't defect, as the Western media is saying. Uh, incidentally, yes, I, someone asked, have I met Tara Reid? Yes, I did meet Tara Reid in Moscow. Uh, I just couldn't say anything because she, she, um, she wasn't ready to admit anything or announce anything. Um, but with Scott Ritter made exactly that point. Uh, no, I, I haven't gone there. I've come back because I'm a patriot, because I love my country. I'm saying the things because I'm a patriot and I love my country. I'm criticizing the people I believe need to be criticized. And uh, Biden uh, is worthy of criticism. I believe, just as Boris Johnson, Sunak, and the many prime ministers we had in that time, <laughs> certainly in the UK, Trudeau, uh, hands up, anyone who thinks Trudeau needs criticism, uh, maybe even replacement, Macron, maybe, I don't know, I'm just throwing these names out there for consideration. Uh, conversely, Vucic, um, how much criticism is he really uh, worthy of? And Orban, uh, I, don't, I don't think the population of uh, Serbia and Hungary you know, are that as critical of their leadership as as those previous names I've just mentioned in the West. And yet, um, the attitude is, and I know it's actually quite dark, even in the UK, people are emailing me saying that they're, they're, they're afraid to speak out in their own in their own country. One guy was within the security services. He said, I work with trying to detect explosives. And if I were for one instant to, to say that maybe I agreed with something Putin has said or the Russian perspective in some way, uh, he, in his words, said, I genuinely would fear for my life that I would find uh, uh, an explosive device that might detonate. Um, and that was within uh, the UK, uh, I guess, law enforcement security system. And that, for me, was quite a wake-up call because, I mean, the, these are stories I heard from Nazi Germany. Yeah. If, um, thing. And yep. then Redacted doing this report about that Deer app that um, Max Blumenthal uh, went and viewed in downtown DC and how they're proud about how you can rat out on your neighbor using this app. It's the heartbeat of the state in your smartphone uh, that's being tested and trialed that in sounds, Ukraine. That sounds yeah, healthy. Sounds, sounds lovely. Yeah, brilliant. I mean, it's kind of the thing that was, again, leveled at China. China's got this thing and these apps. And yet uh, the head of, I think, Visa, 
was one of the USAID is big down. I think you know everyone watching. Uh, I highly advise all of you to to go take a look at Redacted's uh, report on this and Max Blumenthal's interview, because <laughs> these are all the things like Orwellian. And again, Orwellian is thrown around. That's got cheap now. 1984 has seemingly lost its meaning now. It's just so commonplace that it's and it's so obvious in front of us that it just yeah it beggars belief. Yeah, and and just to be just so people are aware that um, when you do speak up in the West, you are most certainly at risk. Mike, you've mentioned s several times everyone that's been arrested or harassed or who's uh, threatened by by legal action or by being detained, even if it's just temporarily. Th there is huge risk in doing this now in the West, and and you know we we've talked about this many times, Angelo and I, that it's. Because the West is getting desperate, They're, years ago they wouldn't do things like this because they weren't so insecure. They felt that they were in control and they could afford to let people uh, say their part because it didn't make any difference. Now it does make a difference. Mm. Uh, so there are consequences to speaking up and, and being effective at doing this. And circling back, uh, Mike, to you going to the Donbass and how difficult that is for you, but you, you said it yourself. I was going to say, I was going to say, uh, people that can do it must do it because if if they don't do it, who will do it? And mm. someone has to definitely do that. So I uh, have a lot of respect for you doing that. I'm glad that you're doing that. I know there's other people who are doing that. Patrick Lancaster, I'm, I mean, I just can't even imagine how over all of these years witnessing mm. what the Ukrainian government has done to the people of the Donbass, uh, how he copes with that over because it's again, people that don't, if you haven't experienced it, it's hard to explain. Everything turns a shade uh, grayer, I guess you could say, when you see these things, you see people dying, you see the destruction, everything gets a little grayer in your mm -hmm. in your whole world, your whole perception of reality. So uh, it is, it's something that people like, if they can do it, they have to do it. And it is making a difference, most certainly. Or the, why, why would the West be going after these people? Why would they have Gonzalo Lira arrested? Why would they keep Julian Assange uh, locked up? Why would they detain Kit Clarenberg at the airport? Why would they do that if it wasn't making any difference, <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so we're, we're, we're coming up to an hour. I don't know if you want to stick around for, well, maybe field some questions from the chat. Are you okay with yeah, that, looking, Mike? Yeah. Angelo, if yep. you have a question, just capital Q or question in all caps, and then your question, and we'll we'll try to, uh, and while we're waiting for that, um, uh, any 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 other like uh, closing thoughts before we get to the, the questions? Um, yeah, closing thoughts. Um, well, yeah, I'm not sure really what to add because we, we <laughs> Angela, kind of well, like not, not a closing thought because we're not really clo closing yeah. up yet, sure, but sure. maybe like Been any summary, last but... things that you most you, you definitely want to to say before we do uh, questions and answers. I'm I'm wait, I'm looking in the chat for some. Or even you, Angela, if you have. I'd like to some mention point. something that actually the, the Durant they, they mentioned once in a while, but which is really important to me to say that uh, just think for a second uh, a year ago. Uh, just the Minsk agreement, it just, you know, you, those conditions, they were like so much feasible. Uh, nothing would have happened and it was like extremely win-win. It was not asking much. If you really look at the conditions of the Minsk agreement and, uh, and, and we, where are we today? The, the request, what, what, what Putin was asking was so little so little mm. and where are we today and what is the cost yeah and and that's something that people need to actually study the background of this conflict before they jump in and jump on a, a specific side they need to i mean i i was debating this german guy who had like multiple degrees he's supposed to be super smart but he didn't even know what the minsk agreement was he's just <laughs> watching the news and the news told him to be upset about russia and so he was that was an educated person, yeah, supposedly. He didn't pay attention to Angela Merkel's admissions. No. Yeah, okay. yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Odd. Okay, we, we have some questions. Question. They're not really... 
they're not really specifically for Mike, but they're just things like, does Ukraine have any airfields to launch the F-16s from? Not, not really. I mean, any anything that they said is going to get hit on the ground or shot out of the sky because that's what happened to Ukraine's air force that they had in February 2022. Yeah, the uh, again, I'll reference that visit to the Lugansk uh, Joint Center for uh, Coordination regarding these hits, and they collect the evidence. The hypothesis and speculation on their part was that due to the dwindling numbers of uh, aircraft that Ukraine even has just across the board, not to mention type, is that it was most likely that these storm shadow missiles were launched from NATO aircraft flying into Ukrainian airspace, presumably, presumably from like uh, Romania, Moldova or Poland around there, firing them off outside of the range of the integrated air defense, um, whereby it could then use its ability to skim across the landscape uh, under up radar. And that was the method by which that they were uh, deploying these storm shadows. So when you mentioned about the F-16, as Brian rightly pointed out, that is presumably where we're seeing this rush to get these F-16s supplied so that more storm shadows and similar munitions can be launched in such a fashion, presumably. So I don't expect that there's a need for suitable runways and servicing. In fact, it's better not to have them in Ukraine because Russia will strike them and will destroy them. So keep them in NATO territory and it's just a, a short flight time to get it into the area it needs to be to launch these long range munitions. That, but that's extremely dangerous because what if Russia is like, well, this airfield in Poland's got to go. Uh, that that would be a Which major has been stressed. escalation. I don't know if Russia will do that. I mean, do you think Russia mm. would do that, Mike? No, no, despite Medvedev's um, saber rattling and even Lavrov and among others who've said it makes them legitimate targets, uh, I, I believe that once they cross in, uh, to the, I, th I think Russia still believes that it has to be in the area of uh, Ukraine for it to be fair game. Otherwise, it risks playing into the Western uh, policy of trying to escalate and escalate and seek justification. Um, speaking speaking of the e European Union, are they going to try to get out of this conflict before the U.S.? Well, it's not actually the EU's decision to make, is it? <laughs> Does anyone think that it's the EU's decision to make? I think whether they're in or out of made this? it pretty clear, didn't she? With her, her saying that there can be no ceasefire, there can be no uh, pause, uh, operational pause of any nature. Yes. Um, uh, when will the spring offensive begin? Not, not in the spring. It's over already. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's it's officially over, so we can rest easy now. It's it's the summer offensive. Okay, how about this one? UK citizen here. Does the government actions disgust you as much as they do me? I'm ashamed of my country. But, I, you know, speaking as an American, I'm ashamed of the US government. The American people are being dragged along. Um, what, what about you, Mike? Uh, most the most UK? specifically, now it's uh, people in glass houses shouldn't throw stones, is my opinion, because all this talk about, oh, Russia's so corrupt. And yet London being the money laundering capital of the world of Russian money, actually, from oligarchs and all this attracting all the Russian money uh, for me was another case. Uh, and look at Boris Johnson uh, and his accounts and all this and shady stuff going on. And if you don't think that oh, we even had it back in the Blairite days with uh, cash for honors, you know, buying lordships and all this stuff, the UK has no right to be on a high horse, certainly not a moral one. Uh, and judge others. And I think Russia has, its diplomats have said exactly the same thing. You're in no position to lecture any other country on such ethics and morals. I, I think when it comes to corruption, in, in reality, in the collective West, what they've done is that uh, they've legalized and they've rebranded mm. under other names. It's called lobbying. So, lobbying, exactly. Lobbying, you know, lobbying, that the, lo the typical lobbying you have in the EU and in the US, if it was done in China, you go to jail. And big, yeah. big time. So Same in the, Russia, actually, I think. Well, exactly, exactly. So mm -hmm. it's just you rename it. It's not that there is no corruption. No, you legalized it. That's even worse. Mm. Uh, Mike, when you're in the, the pub in Russia and the walls, people are getting a few drinks in them and the walls come down, is Finland joining NATO? Is this their deepest, darkest fear? No, not at all. No. Um... <laughs> <laughs> well, the Finns and the Russians have always had, <laughs> had an interesting relationship, uh, but no, that's that's not a fear. 
uh, really of the general population, not, uh, not of Russians, that I've come into contact with. And to speak of the Russian authorities, uh, before I left for Donbass, I did read of large amounts of military equipment going north of St. Petersburg on the MCAD, um, including what I... Someone said nuclear missile launches. I think what they meant, given that they were civilian, I think these were like S-300s or S-400s. I think it was anti-aircraft defense systems along with large numbers of tanks. So uh, Russia's preparing itself. You, maybe you could say that's fear, but I, I would say that's more of putting the necessary measures in place along the borders where they are deemed necessary. There has been some strengthening of the border, I think. They also, interestingly and quite hilariously, uh, rescinded all the visas of the Finns that were nipping across the border to fill up their petrol tanks and then driving home. <laughs> so they're like, ah, oh, so you'll badmouth Russia and then fill up your <laughs> petrol tank for cheap. Maybe we're going to put a stop to that. <laughs> yeah, but the problem when it comes to Finland, they, they are actually breaking a promise. There was a promise yeah. uh, at World War II that the, the Finland was supposed to stay neutral. Because Some uh, people have said that, ah, but that was between the Soviet Union. But given that uh, the Russian Federation inherited the, you know, the the treaties and so on, then I don't, I don't think but, that argument. But that's an really easy one. That's an easy one because yeah. otherwise, Finland could have been actually on the eastern side of, you know, under the Warsaw Pact, and and so they broke a promise. And well, again, it's just does it make sense for Finland just to be? to be uh, in nato it's just it's just absurd you know it was it was fine for 50 years why you know just leave mm. the status quo and, and, and stay neutral yeah and, and as mike just pointed out they're already paying the price for doing it no yeah. no more cheap gas uh here's a question do do you predict a nato intervention and i have said been. since the very beginning yeah well yeah yeah that, there's that <laughs> also, uh, something more over like a, a buffer zone or something set up in Western mm. Ukraine. I, I'm almost certain they're going to try to do something like that. You, you can see them trying to set it up already. Like rhetorically, they're trying to set it up. Uh, Angela, what about you? Do you think uh, NATO uh, intervention? They, they are desperate. Uh, I think uh, uh, I'm more actually afraid of uh, of Poland. Poland uh, acting uh, on their own, and and probably they, they won't be under the umbrella of the uh, Article Five of uh, NATO. I, I I'd, I'd be you know because all, all the Baltic states just combine together, just do this some so do do something crazy. But I I I doubt I doubt there would be the unity of NATO. Uh, I could imagine a few countries not going along. Maybe France. You know I, I doubt they'd, they'd be going along. So it would be just part of NATO not all NATO. But uh, actually, by the way, by the way, actually, whenever even uh, when the, there's Article 5 enacted, you know, uh, you countries can actually choose what the 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 their implication. So Article 5 doesn't actually mean that you you can come at the help, but you can send some helmet or you can have boots on the ground. That, that's what it means. But it doesn't mean that you, you go full in. So I, I could imagine uh, I'd be, uh, imagine a breakup of of NATO of uh, you know the the crazy uh, Chihuahua states uh, Baltic states with uh, with Poland going along. Uh, how about this? Where is Russia going next? They just took Bakhmut. I I think they're going to parry the the offensive whenever it happens. Uh, they and they're just going to continue grinding. I don't think they have any big big arrow offenses planned. Uh, Mike, what what is your sense on that? No, I agree. Um, they're going to continue uh, grinding away. It's been successful. Uh, certainly it was in Bakhmut from the Russian perspective. Uh, I know that the West says Bakhmut was a wonderful victory. Uh, so so many Russian dead, which the, the numbers just don't add up from the, the Western side. Uh, I, I believe that obviously the ultimate intention at this point in time is to fully liberate the areas that are recognized by Russia as being part of the Russian Federation. There is talk, you know, will they have to go across the Dnipro? I, I think that the West would like to tease Russia and uh, force them to do it. Uh, I don't believe, actually, at this point that they want to. Uh, I would have to defer to to someone, uh, sort of a better military strategist, such as Colonel McGregor or Scott Ritter, to give their, their two cents on that aspect, uh, not to mention Odessa, which is uh, another one. Yes. Um, how about how about this one? Are, are we all paid directly or indirectly by the Russian government? And 
I, I just want to point out, look, um, at this point, do you really honestly believe someone needs to be paid by the Russian government to point out what is wrong with Western foreign policy? Did you just come out from under a rock and you you didn't know about Afghanistan, Iraq, Libya, Syria, Georgia from 2003 to 2008, uh, the U.S. admitting that they overthrew the elected government of Ukraine in 2014, the shelling of the Donbass region for the last eight, nine years. Um, why, why would we have to be paid by Russia to, to want to speak up and say this? As, you know, as, as we j- just all pointed out, uh, we're, we're upset that our respective nations are not living up to their full potential. They've been hijacked by a small handful of people who are obviously running the, the collective West into the ground. So not, no, you don't have to be paid by Russia to speak up. Um, if you do get paid to like write an article or if uh, Mike starts working at RT, you can't just point at the funding and say, oh, he's being funded by the other side. You actually, you still have to find what he's saying that is a lie or that is inaccurate or that is wrong. It's, uh, it's lazy and it's dishonest to just say, look at the funding and and people say that that's what i do i point out ned funding for this group or that group but actually i meticulously go through the disinformation the lies the propaganda and the meddling that they're involved in i don't just point at the funding uh people who write for like different publications the the western media it's the uh, cnn bbc these are not all charity cases these aren't all volunteers they're all paid the the fact checkers as well (laughs) they don't do it from the goodness of their heart God bless them. Uh, did, you, did you know that the media organization has to hire external fact checkers because apparently journalists are are obligated or required to die? I used to think that that was the, yeah. a journalist only job. Was Integrity to, to the facts, you know, maybe. No. Uh, the, the, the response that I used to love giving people when they would comment like, ah, oh, it paid by Putin. Well, first of all, I'm, I'm still waiting for my check from the Kremlin. But it was wonderful to point out that certainly up until recently, by and large, uh, I was paid mainly by Google (laughs) from YouTube ad revenue. And then I don't know if it's even funnier or even more uh, important to point out. Well, now I'm actually still paid by the West in the form of people from these Western countries. That's where I derive my support from now. So it's literally the opposite. It's definitely not the, the Russian government. And again, why would they pay me, uh, given that up to date, I've been voluntarily uh, saying uh, what I'm saying and showing the Russian media, which the West banned. Um, and again, read into that what you will. So no, they don't have to pay me. And unfortunately, Russia's, Russia's quite good at capitalism. So if someone's just going to do a service for free, they're not going to pay for it. <laughs> I think they're stingy too. I mean, uh, well, look at the, the budget, the budget the West has. You know, yeah. just a simple budget, you know, uh, like uh, if for China, when it comes to the Belt and Road Initiative, there is a budget of $500 million per year to demonize China on the Belt and Road Initiative. You know, yeah. they have, so, I mean, we talk about, if there is if there is a budget, you know, the, I think the proportion would be a uh, hundred times bigger than what you have in China and, and Russia. You know, they, they, they're stingy. They, they don't pay for that, you know. He, he, the only way they, they pay you is that, you know, if you were write an article, they come, you know, they give you a, but, but it's nowhere near the money you could get if you were like anti-Chinese or anti-Russian. Oh, sure. If I would have, yeah, if I'd have taken the other tack, like imagine oh. at the beginning of the special military operation, of course, I'd have probably um, uh, caused, caused myself trouble in Russia, actually, and been a foreign agent, literally. Uh, in the Russian perspective, but if I'd have if I'd have started waving the Kiev flag and and cheerleading from them, uh, it would have been stupid to do. But um, yeah, I could have made loads. I could have I could have then gone back to the UK, you know, worry, oh, seen my family, like and then I could have been like, I, I I've got credibility because I used to live in Russia for a while. Yeah, I can I can say yeah. Oh, the Ukraine's such heroes, and all this stuff. Yeah, if I was interested in money. Yeah, I could have sold out. And uh, I love how it that's what's flipped around. Oh, someone even put in the comments here, Mike just banged a Russian woman and turned traitor. <laughs> wow, I sold myself out cheap there, didn't I? Whoa. Uh, yeah, so yeah, we you know, we could go on for quite a while with that. And sure, it's the same sure. case for me. I'm I I'm the the 
you know, I, I'm supported by my viewers. That's what makes everything possible. And a lot of my my viewers are from the West. So it it really is like just like I was saying, you don't have to be paid by Russia to see what's wrong. You don't have to be a Russian to see what's wrong. Plenty of people in the West see what's wrong and they're willing to pay for people to do the work that the Western media should be doing but are not doing. So uh, other people have to step, step up. And as you were saying, Mike, we're painting targets on ourselves and we can see other people I'm doing literally similar on things. It, so I do literally yes, have you a are. I, on my head. I saw, I saw that. And uh, Gonzalo Lira literally uh, kidnapped out of his apartment at gunpoint uh, for just pointing out basic facts that even the US government has has openly mm -hmm. admitted. Yeah. So let's see what else do we have here. Um, let's see what is what is the real feel right now in Russia regarding the drone attacks in Moscow. You're you're in Russia. How 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 are ordinary Russians reacting to that? Uh, actually, today it was the talk of the attacks near Smolensk, uh, which I think were on fuel depots. Um, these were people that were discussing it in Sochi, uh, all places. Um, again, we've we've seen it with those attacks in Moscow as well. It's it's solidifying um, Putin's backing and justification for everything, because these uh, if it had, if these resulted in military gains or a significant setback for the Russian military of some nature, then it would it would be negative. Uh, you know, the Russian people may would then question the authorities and their strategies. But these types of attacks, absolutely not. And I'm baffled how, why Ukraine does it. And I, I have to agree with you, Brian, that because they don't have any other options, really. There is nothing more they can do. And let's face it, they're being advised to do it by the NATO advisors, the Western advisors and all this. They're being told to use these terrorist tactics. But why the West doesn't see how counterproductive that is and proven so, I just don't know. And this is where I suspect that it's almost sabotage in a way. Some of the stupidity that I've seen from the West, I, I think, well, at one point, is it stupidity? And then what point is it almost intentional sabotage? Like Olaf Scholz and the German economy. That was beyond stupid, uh, in my opinion. <laughs> it's hard to tell sometimes. I'm like, yeah. I, I'm constantly conflicted. Are these, do these people have like some 3D or like 5D chess game going on? And that's why they're doing this. Or are they really just this stupid and incompetent? And they're just running out, just auguring the West straight into the ground. And I, you know, sometimes I see, uh, actually most of the time I see compelling evidence that they are just, they've just completely lost it. And I have a sustainable premise to start with and everything they build on top of it is, is falling over and uh, Angela Even and I using, talk about amusing this analogy like every... Kamala Harris being named like the protector against AI uh, I think it was the Aussies were the saying <laughs> that's genius because she's going to combat AI with natural stupidity and then played the clip when she was talking about in this moment of time we have to be cognizant and conceptualize the moment of time we're in in relation to the past and the present and the future <laughs> <laughs> And yeah, I, I like how she says something that's not even funny and she cackles and there's <laughs> like people in the audience are like, some people are like genuinely scared because this is very yeah, unnatural well, uh, behavior and other people are uh, just embarrassed for her. That's the yeah. vice president of the United States, by the way. You and then we talk about the president now. who just keels over when he steps off the, the, <laughs> the stage, what was it, in front of that graduation ceremony and then people cheered. <laughs> cheering I, I heard that i was like was there something else going on that i didn't that was oh well there is in my that. clip because on telegram they were spliced with putin testing the new sniper rifle I saw <laughs> <laughs> I didn't share that on telegram but uh, i did see that <laughs> see that was pretty funny well uh, again if you don't laugh you're, you'll cry <laughs> yeah exactly honestly um all right. So I, I get and like just to bring it back to something more serious, I guess, is um, a roller coaster of emotions. Uh, what will happen to Gonzalo Lira? I honestly I don't know, but it's very obvious the US government doesn't care and they're going to let him rot there. And I think the point of doing this is to make an example out of him and try to scare other people, I guess, people like us uh, yeah. to stop, to stop what we're doing, uh, make it uh, you you'll be next. So people mm -hmm. that are doing what we're doing, we have to be careful. We have to protect ourselves. We have to make very difficult decisions about our future, uh, how we're going to protect ourselves. And we just have to accept that this is part of 
doing this in this this geopolitical climate. And then a follow up question, a related question, I should say, uh, people claiming that Gonzalo Lear might may be an SBU agent. If he was an SBU agent, he was the worst SBU agent ever. Because yeah. uh, I, I talked to him all the time. He never got any kind of any, I don't have any useful information to give him that the SBU could use. <laughs> and we talked a lot. So, I mean, that's what he was doing. He's, he was way, way off uh, script, SBU script. He wasn't really doing a good job. So if he was, he was a bad SBU agent. But I don't think that he was. I mean, just... Were people trying to claim around like maybe he was a Goldstein or something? Like attracting dissidents, maybe? I don't, I don't know what sort of, again, 5D sort of chess... People think Gonzalo Lira might have been playing, but no, that's ridiculous. And I'll add to that, yeah, the latest yeah. report is he's facing, what, 13 years in prison. And the U.S. State Department saying they had no comment. No comment <laughs> about it. Again, only which, serves. It, which it is a serve, comment. You, which, it, yeah, that very much and tells you a lot uh, that you need to know about it. And therefore, again, like I just said about the counterproductivity of these civilian strikes, again, it doesn't it doesn't serve to instill fear in me it serves to justify me in in what i'm doing because this is the clear behavior that i'm against and i am for freedom of speech and freedom of the press uh, and which is clearly what we're not seeing here and that is um well that's conducive and consistent with this um, regime that was in germany not so long ago 80 odd years ago so who would have thought uh, that yeah, actually think... we, we would defect you know we I, I lived, you know, I, I'm, I'm old enough just to have to have lived a little bit, you know, during a cold, cold uh, war era. And uh, who would th think that actually now you'd have a trend of uh, Westerners defecting to Russia? And, wow. and I think this is a thorough read. That's only the, the, the beginning. We see more and more. And keep in mind one thing, very important. Everything we see, the behavior of the collective West, right now we are not yet at war just think for mm -hmm. one second if we were at war opposition and people mm -hmm. i would say we are quite safe because we are outside of the collective west well now imagine journalists in the west what they did to kick Karenberg these days well mm -hmm. imagine if they are at war they will shut down I, actually there will be self-censorship most of them they will not take the risk or they will have to defect it's already happened in Ukraine where they shut down all the opposition parties, roughed them up, disappeared them yeah. and all this. And people seem to close their eyes to it. Uh, as I said, there's already that feeling in certain members of the population, certainly those that have messaged me from the UK, that they feel too afraid to speak out um, at risk of their own lives in some extreme cases. Uh, again, people in the comments can deny or corroborate that uh, as they wish. Uh, I saw it with companies, certainly in the gaming field, they were too fearful to deal with a company based in Dubai because it was maybe likely that the money would go to Russia and they were afraid what their government might do to them in sanctions. So this, is this really the behavior of a free and democratic society? I didn't think so. In the case of Tara Reid, uh, yeah, I like that word, defects. Uh, I think Alex Christoforou picked up on it as well. So the West were using, like, oh, she defects to Russia. Defects? She wasn't a spy. She accused Biden of assault. <laughs> but that's not defecting that's uh, and she had good cause and concern i think was it not a senator that warned her uh, that said that your life's going to get very difficult now that biden's going up for his um re-election campaign and it was quite likely that the government was trying to clean house get rid of any inconvenient truths or inconvenient stories that might tarnish biden's already <laughs> terrible image uh, but yeah, that was seemingly the reason why she came here. And I can report that she feels extremely relieved to be in Russia. And um, for the first time, she says she feels safe. And I'm very glad for her. And, and what does that say about the West and where it is right now? And just, just think about Snowden. Uh, a lot of people uh, con condemned him for doing that. But he would definitely be in jail right now, along with Julian Assange. Uh, yeah, There's best. someone else, uh, Daniel Hale, who who uh, blew the whistle on U.S. drone warfare around the globe. And they said, well, he's in jail because he could have went through the proper channels and this all would have gotten addressed. He came out and he exposed the entire thing. Uh, the media reported on every aspect of it. And they just they they doubled down on their drone warfare campaign. And they were killed. They continued killing innocent people all around the globe. So not to uh, mention the horrible yeah, things that happened to Bradley Manning as well. 
Yes, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, the list just goes on and on yeah. and it's getting worse and worse and worse. So I, you cannot blame anybody for wanting to get out of the West. And I, I think you see multipolarism is a geopolitical version of this where nations that had been stalwart allies of the West are, you know, are they defecting? Are they defecting also yeah. when they yeah. uh, no longer want to be the West doormat? And uh, they want they want to move on and continue building things. So, um, what about this Putin's strategy in terms of foreign policy after Ukraine conflict is resolved? How do people in Russia, there, Mike? How do they how do they envision the aftermath of all of this? Russia's well, place in the world. Yeah, I mean that's a good question. In terms of foreign policy, Russia has been uh, even seemingly to its own detriment, ever so patient. Uh, it hasn't been reactionary and knee-jerk and emotional in its responses. But, uh, as I've said before, I was quite perturbed by Medvedev's words, specifically in relation to James Cleverly in the UK, where he said, the UK, our eternal enemy. Up to that point, it had been, first of all, partners, then sort of competitors and adversaries, and then him saying, eternal enemy. Well, yeah, I think um, the West is going to have a hard time repairing relations. We've seen it with Bierbach seemingly spearheading this shutdown of the German diplomatic missions in, in Russia uh, and Germany's presence being withdrawn. And likewise, Russia has taken, um, what do they call it, a protocol of reciprocity. We saw it in Poland where they tried to seize this school and things and froze funds of the Russian embassy. And Russia did the same. Uh, you could say that's knee jerk. I don't. I uh, that was very popular. I think among Russian people, they're like, yeah, they do that. We do that. Let's let's keep it that way. But uh, yeah, I think uh, moving forward, it's going to be very difficult for the West to repair relations for Russia because I don't see why Russia needs to repair those relations. Russia doesn't need to go to these countries. It's going to be certainly, let's say, in the case of Germany. It's going to take, well, at least five, if not 10 years, if not longer. And that's exactly as engineered by the U.S., I believe. The, the U.S. has pulled the strings to ensure that relations remain terrible and very difficult for certainly Germany and Russia in the, the years ahead uh, for this. And I, I think that's not so much an indication of Russia's foreign policy. I think that's precisely as intended by the West and their foreign policy. Can I can I jump into this, and, uh, Angelo? Yeah, I think, I think we need to to look in terms of uh, time. I mean, time heals things somehow. You know, the, uh, now now you know we are in hot spirits, and uh, you know everybody's mm. very upset, especially in Russia. They feel betrayed by the Europe. They being you know the you know Russia not so long ago they they want to actually to even to go into NATO. They were open to Europe. Mm -hmm. they, they extended a hand all the time, and the West, the collective West, rejected that hand. So now Russia is turning more towards Asia. But we need to keep in mind that I think what Putin is doing is not, it's not crossing a certain line because it knows that at some point everybody will have to sit down and make peace. So very often what they say is that, you know, war is, is a preparation for the next peace. It's just that you, you do war so you are going to be in a, in a better position to negotiate. But ultimately... There's going to be peace. And ultimately, Europe, you cannot actually separate physically Europe and Russia. So you will have exchanges like you always had. Actually, even in times of war, Russia is still selling oil and gas to Europe. You see, why? You, you see, one, one thing that Putin did and shows clearly the long term game of Putin was that he never stopped uh, uh, shipping gas and oil to Europe. He could have damaged so badly Europe, he didn't do it. Why? Because there's a long game. It's the long-term game. Russia will always be there uh, and at some point we'll sit down because, you know, I mean, at some point people people will, will need to be, you know, become adults. And I, I, and I think time is in, in favor of the multipolar world. I think the hope of Putin is that, you know, it's not going to be disintegration of the, the Russia. You know, somehow big changes are going to happen. My prediction is disintegration of NATO and EU because it's, those are not sustainable projects and, and it's just a matter of time.
just a matter of time. Yeah, and and I, I agree with that. And I think uh, where will Russia be geopolitically after this is over? I think closer to a constructive part of a multipolar world. That's what happens throughout the duration of the, the U.S. proxy war in Syria. And I think that's what is, what is going to happen through throughout this conflict and whatever the U.S. tries to cook up against China. I think they're they're pushing the world toward multipolarism faster than I think it would have developed on its own. I and think that's where. Yes. Yes. And the clock of de-dollarization constantly ticks. Uh, that is that is a very good point. Uh, so we are at the one hour and 30 minute mark. I think we're right, right on time. Um, I want to thank you both for joining me uh, for Angelo. This is his Friday night that he always takes off to to join us. I want to thank you both for taking your time to, to join me on this live stream. Mike, can you just tell people where they can find your work in the video description below and in a pinned comment? after the stream is over, I'll, I'll list everything there for people to find and follow your work, but may, maybe you could just help people right now. Yeah, thank you very much indeed, uh, Brian, first of all, for having me and uh, allowing me to speak to your audience, especially whilst I'm banned on YouTube. I do appreciate that, uh, given their efforts. Uh, on Earl, uh, I've got my Telegram channel, which is actually probably now my kind of primary uh, outlet for my uh, content, which is t.me forward slash TV. Uh, then I have locals, ilgray.locals.com. Um, those are those are kind of the two outlets. I have Rumble and Odyssey uh, as well for those people who prefer those platforms. Uh, but yeah, that's where you can usually find me and interact with me. So again, thank you very much okay, for having yeah. me. Thank you, Angelo, for, for joining me tonight. It's been a real pleasure. Okay, and I'm gonna I'm gonna add uh, locals to the list. That was the one that I that I forgot. So again, thank you everyone, and thank you everyone who joined the live stream. Uh, just you you know what to do. Click like, subscribe, all of that. Uh, again, thank you all, and until next time, bye for now. Bye bye. <laughs>